Hello and welcome everybody to a very special edition of the Buy Round interview show. Uh, we are joined by somebody that has changed how we watch and listen to our great game of rugby league. Someone who's grilled me a couple of times in interview shows and a bit of a farewell show as well. Um, can be described as a little bit of a trailblazer, uh, Yvonne Sampson. Thank you so much for having me. What a beautiful intro. Thank you. That's very, very kind. And that's always the difficult part as well. It so is it'll the be hardest a bit part. More natural. Um, <laughs> it's off season. How are you? Wonderful. I do miss footy. How long does it take you to miss footy? Because I'm probably about, I don't know, it takes me about two weeks to really decompress a bit. And it's because I was a Broncos fan. I am a Broncos fan, not was. Ooh. I didn't ditch him after the yeah. grand final. <laughs> um, so it took me a little while to get past that just emotionally. And then and then I think I start to miss it much earlier than I should. But, yes, off-season is always beautiful. But as we know, there's really no off-season in our great game. Yeah, it, it keeps on ticking over. There are, there has been a few moments where, you know, like a Sunday or a Thursday, and I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm free. I know. What am oh, I doing? Yeah, I, I, I can do that. What is a weekend? And like, <laughs> it, you almost, I don't, it, it feels like subconsciously something's gone. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, I should be do doing I, something. What do I normally do? Oh, that's right. I'm usually having cups of tea with Jimmy yeah. on a Friday night. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, we're normally <laughs> talking that. Um, talking about missed tackles. Yeah. <laughs> Meters gained. <laughs> Which coach should be sacked? Who should come in? Um, so what, what, what takes over your life then? So you will get a short, a short break, holiday, family time. Just do, do you have other events to host as well? You do. I know you do some yeah. presentations and whatnot. Yeah, post season presentations are always really fun. I love getting back to clubland and. Um I, I don't know. I really like it. I love seeing who wins Rookie of the Year and who wins Clubman of the Year. And I, I don't know. I think it's, it takes me back to when I first started covering footy back in regional Queensland and I'd cover like, you know, the Nambour Crushers or the Noosa Pirates or something. And, and it's still got that real grassroots connectedness because all the families and the friends and the mums and dads, they all show up. So I, I still like all the post-match prezos. Um, what do I do? I uh, sit at home for a little bit and think about the year that was. <laughs> 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 um, and then hopefully we try and get away maybe for a week or so, um, you know, somewhere near the beach, maybe get home to Queensland for a little bit. But, yeah, nothing too extravagant. I think last year I went and house sat for Andrew Voss, Fossey, because they took over. <laughs> so we went down to the Southern Highlands, which was beautiful. So I just sat at, um, set up Christmas in Chateau de Voss in ah, the Southern Highlands. It was gorgeous. That's all right. Isn't it house sitting that is... Um it's very retro. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, who needs an Airbnb when you can just house sit That's for that? That's right. I had to look after uh, Philip the Oxalotl. Uh, What's You know an those little uh, crawling lizard things? And, he, you know, they've got, they're like a Mexican walking foot fish and they've got gills and. No. Okay. No. Uh, um, so he's got one of those. He's got one I'm of assuming. those and a little bunny, and that was it. And then, uh, yeah, and then we just parked it up. It was beautiful. They, so he's got a, a, <laughs> a South American lizard. Yeah. And a bunny rabbit. And a bunny rabbit. And do you know when you're That's looking a, like, after someone's a... stuff, you don't want to, you don't want anything to die on your watch, right? Oh. So <laughs> Philip and the bunny were the priorities. The rest of the family and Christmas came after that. So no, it was yeah. beautiful. But the, yeah. this year we'll just we'll keep it local. We'll stay I, at home. I've got I've got a friend that um was looking after his parents' tortoise. Oh. Um, he lost it. <laughs> Did it turn up? Um, he repl he secretly replaced it, and then uh, the following Christmas they found the dead one <laughs> in the Christmas decoration <gasps> cupboard, mummified in oh, the Christmas decorations. <laughs> like he, his mum didn't speak to him for like about a year. Oh god! Like this talk, like. And I think she was like, you lied to me about yeah. like all that. And yeah. I trusted you with this one job. <laughs> you uh, packed yeah, him so up big, with the Christmas lights. Big shout out to Scotty Donaghy. <laughs> um, well done on losing your tortoise, mate. Um, so you, you speak there about, about going back to your roots. And it always fascinates me. You know, if you were to turn on Fox League, we see you there hosting. But how did you arrive at, at that point the can you tell us a little bit about what it was like growing up um because i believe you big into your horses as well yeah i think um so i'm adopted and and mum and dad would have wanted heaps of other kids but it was really hard to adopt back in those days in the sort of late 70s early 80s so 
um, they waited on the adoption registry for so long down in New South Wales. They ended up moving to Queensland and the um, the wait list was so much shorter. So then they got a phone call on a Friday and said, can you be in Townsville on a Monday and went and picked up this baby and that was me. So, really? yeah, it was really nice. So, and they, I mean, dad was a, he grew up in Balmain. He was a Tigers fan. He was a butcher. He studied at the Sydney Conservatorium of Music. So he was Bob the singing butcher and the whole thing. So he loved footy. So that's where I picked up footy. And I think for me, because people say, you know, you must have had a brother who played or a dad who played or and I no, none of us are any good at anything. We just love the game. And for me, rugby league became about family. So, you know, the one game that we'd get every week, we'd all sit down and make sure that we it was Tigers back in those yeah. days. Um and then because we we lived on the Sunshine Coast and <clears throat> dad would drive me down because the Brisbane rugby league was massive in Queensland. This is before um Broncos came in in eighty eight. And so and we were origin everyone north of the tweed is a state of origin fan <laughs> so we were all massive wally lewis fans so dad every as a treat would drive down to brisbane you know pack up the old falcon put a thermos on and mum would pack some sandwiches and we'd go off and it feel, felt like such a big road trip from hinterland sunshine coast to brisbane which is probably i don't know like nowadays it's about an hour and a half it felt like it was a whole day trip um and we would go down and watch i think while I was playing for winter manly by this stage and so for for me, footy became just part of what it was to enjoy your weekends or time with dad or, you know, get grandma, you know, mama and papa around and, and watch the footy. So I think for me, I always loved the game and growing up, I liked to tell stories and, you know, we had a little book week and we had horses. My grandfather was a racehorse trainer. So it was like racing or rugby league for me and which I, and I think because there was only me, they just treated me like... I wasn't specifically a girl or a boy. I was just Vonnie or they didn't call me. They, they're very particular. It has to be Yvonne. Um, or if my North Queensland family call me, it's Yvonne. Um, <laughs> and I think I always wanted to tell stories, but I was always, and I, I learned pretty quickly through university that I was pretty bad journalist at anything else. So I'm really bad at politics, really bad at day-to-day -day news, really bad at like, you know, fatals and things like that. Like I'm, I'm not mm. very good in that regard. So I thought, well, gosh, I think um, I might try and push into this sport business. And so, yeah, it kind of, it kind of all unfolded from there and, and just a love of the game came naturally to me. And by the time I graduated uni and um, started doing work experience at my local newsroom in Maroochydore, and then I worked in regional Queensland for about 10 years. So, you know, Townsville, Mackay, Wide Bay, just covering everything from like pigeon racing to cricket to so, so you, like again pardon me, I guess for me the pathway to be a rugby league player was simple because that's what I knew that, yeah. was, that was like what I was in my head I, I wanted to happen you've got this burning ambition from quite a young age but how what's the like is it study orientated it's hustling it's just for like because back then it, it probably was a little bit are you just dropping off CVs knocking on doors that yeah, sort of stuff. Well, I did. Uh, yeah, I did work experience. So I did um, journalism at QUT, um, which I don't know. People say, do you need to go to uh, university to do journalism? I don't think so. It was traditionally always a cadetship, and it it certainly is to a large extent now. I think you still do a lot of your learning on the job and when you get out on the road. Um, but I think by the time I went into my third year, I, I realised I needed some work experience and especially if I wanted to do sports. So um, female sports reporters were, weren't really encouraged. They weren't really part of the normal scene of a newsroom. This is a long time ago. This is like 23 years ago. So it was a bit of a novelty to see. And I, and I was certainly treated like a bit of a novelty, you know, if I'd turn up to local training sessions and, you know, the boys would hoop and holler and, the you know, be quite dismissive and you certainly wouldn't feel very welcome. Um, but I think I always wanted to do sport and I never, ever, ever thought that I would ever get to work on rugby league. Um, to be honest, I always thought that I would go or stay in horses. I grew up riding horses on I was on the Australian Young Riders Dressage Squad. I thought I was going to go to the Olympics. I thought, you know, this is this was it. Um, went and rode over in Denmark for a year, prepped yearlings in Stratford-upon-Avon, um, you know, lived in England. Like I loved it. I loved all of that. Um, and that was sort of, I thought, where my future was. But then I, I think things changed at home. Like dad died when I was 20 and I just needed to get serious about 
being able to take care of mum and maybe hold on to the farm that we had. So I think journalism became more of a, an option and, and a serious career path um, for me because I knew at least, you know, there would be a regular, well, hopefully there was a regular paycheck at the end of the week other than writing dressage, which doesn't seem to be fit that financially viable <laughs> unless you're a royal. Yes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I just had to get realistic about it and, 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 and I, lo- I loved, I, I, there's not a single day. Um, so I've been working in a newsroom since I was 19 and there hasn't been a single day that I thought, oh, gosh, what a what a hassle. Or, you know, it's always such a privilege to turn up and, and talk to people. And, yeah, there's some tough days, but it's always been such a great honour to, to be a journalist. Yeah. So obviously you, you mentioned there about um, coming through perhaps a, a different time. Uh, and I spoke about being a, a bit of a trail bla- bra- trailblazer. D- did you feel... That- a bit of extra pressure um, and and some of those setbacks that you would have had just based off, you know, b- being being a female. Yeah, it's funny. I think, um, yeah, definitely I still feel the pressure. I still feel the pressure. I still feel like I'm held to a different standard yeah. than, yeah, than, uh, than you or our other colleagues at Fox. And, and I should be. I haven't played the game. I don't, I'm not afforded the same... Luxury. If I make a mistake, everyone's like, "Oh, you women are ruining the game." Look yeah, at you. But, yeah, but, <laughs> but, what, but you know, well, people like, um, you know, like 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 Crawley, like oh god, you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> all, all the other journalists that are on there, that they, they'd be in the same boat. Yeah, I think you know, Reedy, Reedy. Yeah, know, all, all all those guys would all be in exactly the same boat. But then they've not played the game. But do you think that they? They don't have to. They're not. The public opinion is different. I think so. I think there's probably a, a greater tolerance still to a, to a small degree than it was certainly when mm. I first started. But I think, yeah, to answer your question, and it's funny. I and again, growing up, I was never really pigeonholed into any sort of male or female. Like I was just Vonnie. And I think growing up with horses, you compete equally. So it's yeah. one of the only sports. And I think sailing might be the only one um, where men and women compete equal. There's no male or female class. Yeah, there's, just, no ca- there's no there's separate no, category. There's no, it's so just this is the one that's category. That's right. This yeah. is what we're doing. This is how you achieve and this is how you win and this is how you compete. So I think it was really unusual um, probably by the time I was in my early 20s that news directors would say, oh, well, we don't want a female in our sports department. And I'd be like, oh, gosh. And it, re- it would shock me a little they, bit. They'd say they don't want. Don't want. No, God. What what could I possibly bring to the news department? You know, what could I what could I do for the sports department? And and I've had you know, I mean, I'm not saying that that's this was a long time ago either. I mean, I've had news directors tell me that um, a female voice is not the one that should be the first heard on a rugby league coverage. I've had people say females shouldn't be in and around the game in that hosting capacity. Um, that fans don't want to know that. That they would prefer to hear a woman on the sideline. So it's this really sort of archaic thing and, and it sort of shocked me because I was like, oh, gosh, I, you know, sometimes I forget I am a female and I like I just sort of turn up and want to do my job. I want to be a broadcaster. I want to bring the game to all of the fans. I'm just a fan. I want to be able to do the best I can by the fans at home. And, um, yeah, sometimes it would shock me that they go, well, you know, what, we don't want someone in sport. Can you be the weather girl? Or, you know, like, or they'd say, even just play out, say, I just don't think TV's, I don't think you're suited to TV. You should do something else. I've lost my job multiple times. And and because of, sometimes because of the female aspect, I've got to be honest, um, if I've had a, some difficulties, uh, especially in Queensland, I would have stayed there forever, but there were some difficulties there and um, had it been managed better, I still probably, I never would have left. I loved it there. But those setbacks and that rejection had to be a redirection. And so then I ended up down in Sydney. I didn't, I think when someone says you're not suitable to this or you'll never make it because that's not, people don't want to see a female in rugby league or people don't want to see a female in sport. I kind of thought that they were wrong and and not in a vindictive way, but I just thought, I thought I, I just don't know if that's correct. And I, I owed it to myself to give it a go. Do you, do you think, I often, <clears throat> I often wonder about, these sort of um, when people tell you you can't do something or you shouldn't do something, that you almost need to hear that to get the best, very best, best 
the very best version of yourself to be told you won't. Yeah. And then that that internal drive go, I want to prove you wrong. Like I always think that Jonathan Thurston is the example I, I often bring up about he he was apparently told he, he'd, he'd never make it because he wouldn't be big enough. Too small, now, too much trouble, yeah. do you mean? <laughs> like, I wonder if he was told yeah. that by design. Yeah. You know, like, I'm going to tell him, because who would, you, do, you, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, that drive of being like, no, fuck you. Yeah. I want to, I'll, I'll, I'll prove you wrong. Yeah, I don't. I don't. Mine didn't come from from an aggressive response. Mine came from really stubborn response. I'm quite stubborn, <laughs> and you can use it to your advantage. Mm. And I just thought, I don't know. I, I don't know if that's entirely correct. The mm. feedback I was getting at that time, and to lose your job, it was a big knock, um, because it was also a really good lesson. Because I think also in TV, people get very um, enamoured with seeing themselves on TV. And when that's all taken away, I think all of a sudden you go, oh, gosh, if I'm not on TV or if this is my job, who am I? Mm. Um, and that's when I took off and, and worked overseas and went back to horses and, and I thought, oh, I could be a farmhand. I'm just as happy doing that. And I think it was a really good early lesson. Um, the f one of the first times I got, <laughs> lost my job is that you can't tie your image and your reputation up with what you do for a day job because someone can take that away from you. I think who you are needs to come from a much deeper place and, and who I w am is someone who loves the game. I'm a fan and hopefully still can contribute and make the experience of watching the game enjoyable and um, yeah, it's, you know, times have changed. I've, I've been lucky. I think I came in at the right at the end of what was a bit of a dinosaur era for, for TV and very much a boys club and now I've been able to experience the the, the seismic shift in terms of um, attitudes towards women and respect towards broadcasters and you're just seen as a professional and not necessarily the token woman who um, you know who wants to get into the game so I think I think often they thought I, I wanted to get it to get a boyfriend or or I don't know I don't know I, well, I certainly wasn't taken very seriously but yeah. That's changed. It it has, and you know what? It, it it's funny. I can I can always remember. Um, I'd finished playing. Um, my kids had seen me play live, but and probably a little bit on TV. But then, I was coming back, and I was I think I was on a, a Friday night footy, and the kids had started to watch it, and then the next day they were like, uh, my eldest Harlow was like, Dad, why would the there was a woman talking <laughs> on there? It was you <laughs> like, about footy, like what's what's going on? Yeah, because and and this is her sort of at the time she would have been five and a half, like that's her brain because she'd only ever seen like blokes playing it. She'd not seen it on TV, and probably before the NRLW, and then it was it it really it was a comment that really like knocked me back. I was like, well, yeah, sports are, sports are for everyone. Yeah, like how special is that? Though? Like it's. It was a real learning because uh, I guess for me, ignorance, whatever it may be, just I'm I'm just cracking on. Did, you know, not an, an issue that's affecting me, but sort of it was like, wow, you, you're you're thinking that, and you're you're five. Yeah. Your interpretation of the game is that this is for men, based off what you've seen so far, and obviously now she's exposed to to much 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 more in terms of NRLW. We try and get to a couple of games of that a year, and with the Matildas and. You know the the very presence. She's probably watching a little bit more sport in in terms of we'll have it on with the, you know the build up on as well, and it's just becoming ingrained where it's just normal. And, and isn't that what we're working towards to, to just make it be normal? Because mm. when I was that, Harlow's age, yeah, there, there were no female voices or really that I remember, or certainly you wouldn't see a woman in and around the game as much. And and I remember thinking, gosh, I love rugby league. How would I work in it? And I thought, well. I've either got to be the lady that rides Buck the Bronco around the <laughs> perimeter every time they score a try or, you know, Lady Luck on the footy show. No no knock on Lady Luck. I, I loved the footy show. Everyone watched the footy show. But there really wasn't that role mm. for women in the game and, and that's been such a big shift. And and examples like Harlow and every other little girl out there, if they're mm. seeing women play, they're seeing people comment, women commentate, they're mm. seeing women, it's just so normal. Yeah. It's, well, th they ask. Like I'm one of seven and I've got three sisters and my, my daughters are last like, did you, my aunties play any sport? Did they play, what they call it? Oh, did, did they play footy or did they play soccer? I'm like, no. And they're like, why? It's like, because they, 
Was it encouraged? That, well, not in, only was it not encouraged. There was no. There was no. There was no team. There was no team. Yeah, there was no competition. There was, there, was no, yeah. there was no way for them to play. Yeah. And I was like, far out. Like we've come, and that's well, it's not one generation, but well, technically it is in terms of like, you know, my younger sisters at a, a young age, and then you know my children. Like they've got the opportunity. They're mm. at you know, it, it's almost a full time job dealing with their sport and endeavors, <laughs> and you know, different mon- like. Monday to Wednesday and then sport as well on the weekend. It's practice yeah. sessions and all this. And you're like, wow, we've we've come a long way and and thankfully, but it wasn't that long ago where these pathway systems or even playing any sort of level just, just no. didn't exist. I remember yeah. I was still living on the Sunshine Coast and now um, the very first women's team started up the Sunshine Coast Sirens. And I was prob- I was old by this stage. I was like twenty seven or something. I thought, oh, I'm gonna give it a go, right? farm you know grown I thought I'll be strong you know with horses I'll be all right I'm not very athletic obviously but you know the only thing I can run is a bath but I thought I'll give it a go because I just love it right how hard could it be I got annihilated like for two seasons I got thrashed from pillar to post I was so pathetic at playing rugby league and I absolutely loved it I shut my eyes in every tackle I (laughs) I, like fall to ground like no I had nothing but I absolutely adored it and um and I thought my gosh it's I I just wouldn't be able to have forgiven myself had I not given it a go yeah good good well you, you make this career um you're in you're one of the main hosts on on channel nine and you made the decision to move across to fox with this new 24-hour rugby league channel what was um what was behind that where was the sort of uh, emotion at that time oh i was in tears and I'm not a big crier, but I was in tears. I didn't want to leave nine. I, I'd had the time of my life there. I've made such really good friends, you know, covering Origin and Grand Finals and, like, it was everything. And Steve Crawley, who's our boss at Fox, he'd made the move the year prior uh, across to Fox um, League and they were going to start this new 24-hour rugby league channel. And he said, Vonnie, would you come across? I was off contract at the end of the year and I thought, well, I don't really, I'm not really much of a – you know, jump around. I just kind of only really move if I'm pushed. And I thought, oh gosh, I'd never want to leave. You know, nine gave me such a big break, and I loved everyone there. And and I I, I thought about it for so long. And I spoke to Joey, and I spoke to Lockie, I spoke to, and then Gus. And by the time, because Gus is like he's that dad figure for me. And I think I was almost looking for permission. Yeah. By the time I got to that phone call and I was blubbering away and he goes, Vonnie, it sounds like you've already made the decision. If you want to hear me say go, you can go. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> so I, and I think just the opportunity to to work with crawls and um, to be able to p- be part of something from scratch, um, to be one of those sort of founding members of something that's so exceptional. And it's be, huge, isn't it, it's when, you, when you think about yeah. – Again, I skip back a couple of generations. One game a week. Oh, I know. Yeah, the rest you're reading about in a newspaper. Yeah. To, uh, okay, we're good. Or watching on delay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's. Yeah. I think. And then where we are now with just all this coverage. Yeah. With a dedicated rugby league channel, like there's pros and cons to it, but it's. I think there's more pros than there is cons. Yeah. Uh, it was just you just don't get those opportunities often in mm. life. And so I was always going. Yeah, you, could, you, you know what? You, you couldn't say no. I just was never going to say no. I just I felt so – I just loved it at nine. Mm. You know, I loved the, our little wide world of sports crew. And But, yeah, of course, then you, you move on and you make new friends and you meet new guys and, mm. you know, the next crop of retirees come through. And um, it's funny, people don't get how – uh, how much territory you end up covering together. So like you and I spend a lot of time together when, when you're in on the broadcast mm-hmm. and you do, you become really connected to the people and you, you know, you learn about their family and what's happening. And if you've had a, a good or a shit week and you know, what's ha- you know, like it just, you do become friends. And, um, and for me, that's what I love the most. And obviously you get to sit around watching footy with <laughs> your mates. Like it's, yeah. it's, it is truly the best job on earth. <laughs> so you what what makes a good host, in your opinion? Because I, I, p- 
people just see you for the amount of time you're on TV, but there's so much more that goes into it. Like I get that sort of behind the scenes access and I see you yeah. writing your notes and you've got the teleprompter and you've got all things going on and you're you're there. Like we're not on air till but whatever time and you're there you know, I, I, sometimes like six, eight hours before. Yeah, I have to start my work early though because I write that, it all down. It. Yeah. So you, you, you're not just reading what someone's telling you to oh i say. wish is that so yeah i've so, always but, wanted to know do I, people I, ask you they go what does bonnie have it all written down uh, is someone telling her what to well, say well, in her well, ear? well i th i think that the perception would be you're just reading yeah the i tell so. you just rock up yeah get dolled up get ready to go tv ready and you're just reading whatever they say oh and that'd be a luxury that's <laughs> but can, can you can you talk to the to the listener about just everything that goes into yeah, to, so to, to, to putting on a show. Oh, like a just a bog standard Friday that you and I would work on. Bog standard. <laughs> just a bog, bog standard just a, Friday. You know, just a middle of the season, mm. run of the mill, um, two games. So I, I have to start my work at, a, you know, oh, well, you read everything obviously through the week so you're not left behind on any sort of ins or outs yeah. or injuries. You, you've, or got, you've got to be across. Everything. Everything that's going on. Everything. Um, mm. Pick up the phone. um, try to get a little bit more detail and background yourself a little bit more richly on what's happening uh, in the cut and thrust of the game. And then I, I, because I'm a very methodical person, so I have to write it all down, um, talking points. And if say, cause I wouldn't be doing my job if James, you, you brought up something and took the conversation in a different direction and you often do. So you're a very different thinker. You will see things from a different perspective and if I can't go with you on that conversation, then I'm not doing my job. So I need to try and almost hedge my bets on where certain commentators will take us. And then I've got to keep the conversation going. And if it's going in a direction, I think, oh, well, let's bring James in here because he's going to be really strong on that. You guys are really good. You're all very, you have a lot of buy-in. So you make my job a lot easier. You lean in, you say, yep, I'm next. Um, but no, there's no auto cue. There's no grandmaster behind the scenes telling us what to say or do. So I'll probably have, oh, I'll do four or five hours prep of writing before we get to set. And then of course, then the game is underway. We watch the game. I have, I'm really bad with numbers. <laughs> so I have to write down all the numbers because I get really confused. Um, I can't even add up the score difference sometimes. I've got to get my calculator out. <laughs> um, so, you know, forget it when it comes to missed tackles and post-contact meters. I'm like, oh, my God, this is like Pythagorean theory. Uh, and then I think then you've got – then our responsibility, because w the narrative of the game is unfolding in real time, our responsibility is to what's the storyline? What's the main talking point out of here? Because this is our game. We've got it – we've got the jump on the papers. We've got the jump on the back pages. So if we don't – ask the right questions, push the conversation into a into a space that is moving this game along and moving the storyline on for the players, for that team. What does that mean for the club? What does that mean for the coach? Um, then we're, we're not doing the game justice and we're not doing the coverage justice. So, uh, yeah, it's really important that we are have all eyes on all perspectives and try to think about what's happening in front of us rather than just enjoying the game, which we do. But then, you know, it's work. We've got to work out where we take it from there. Um, so what makes a good host? I think, to be honest, I think a good host, if you don't notice me, then I've done a really good job. If I'm there to bring out the best in you and the best in the other champions that we have sitting there and the premiership winners and the, you know, if Mal's sitting there and if I don't push him on big topics, then I'm not doing my job. Well, well you are almost like the orchestra of the band, right? Because you've got to like br bring, bring people in. Then you've also got someone in your ear, you've got, You've also got ad breaks. Oh yeah, timing. To, yeah, like time. <laughs> timing is is everything. What's it like? And I'm asking you this generally because I'm interested. When you've got when when you're sat there and maybe you've got a player interview or you're talking with a with with, with one of the guests and you think something they're gonna they're gonna say something that's it's gonna be interesting here or it's gonna be not controversial but it's gonna be headline sort of stuff. But you've got like okay, we need to get to break. How do you how do you balance that? Like, have you got a gut and like you just go back to the producer and say, "Look, I, some, I was mining for gold here." Yeah. Like one more, one more. Yeah. Prod, one more question could bring out 
gold. Yeah. And I've seen you guys are amazing now and I think all of our commentators have really stepped into that space that you push a little harder. You're not just like, oh, you know, full credit to the boys and that was good and da-da-da. You understand the appetite and the the – the expectation of a very educated footy fan sitting at home, they want to know a bit more, right? Like that they're not just going to, they don't want you to get in there and roll the arm over. So you guys all have that incredible understanding now, which makes my life so much easier. But you're right. I've, look, being on Fox League so much easier. We're on air 24 hours a day. So we really don't have to get off air because the block's coming on or something. Do you yeah. know, like yeah. <laughs> we're okay. But timing, like, the, the producers do get a bit antsy about timing. Like you do sort of have to hit... Um, you know, within sort of 30 seconds or, you know, they, they get a little bit, you can probably hear them start yelling in my ear and it's probably coming out the other side of my head. <laughs> um, but I think, yeah, you've got to use your gut feeling and, and, and I've missed yarns when it's unfolded. I haven't been paying attention or if I had a producer and me saying, right, we've got to get to a break and I've missed something and I, I should have doubled down. And um, one example was when Latrell Mitchell told us he uh, a couple of years ago, um, not this year, last season, said he, he wasn't going to make himself available for the Blues and I missed it and I should have, you know, I, like obviously that's a major statement yeah. and I, because I could only hear one voice in my head, not two, because <laughs> I had my producer in my ear and I was trying to listen to Latrell and I just skipped over and said, right, Latrell, well, best of luck and da, 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 da. And then we said, and then <laughs> I think it was Cooper said, so sorry, just double checking, did, did Latrell say he's not available for Origin? And I was like, oh, goodness, potentially. <laughs> That's, mm. So thing, major misses like that I really um, sit with me and I think, oh, God, that was such a bad miss. Um, but, look, at the end of the day, it, which, you know, sometimes you just can't yeah. listen to everything. But, yeah, it was just one of those moments where I, I just wasn't paying attention to the right thing. Yeah. Just, just speaking on that, are there any other sort of like memorable games or sort of interviews that, that really stick out for you in, in your mind, either your, your time at nine or – or your time yeah, at Fox. Yeah, God. Um, games, uh, well, for me, because I'm a Queensland fan, so 2015 grand final was just exceptional. Um, I, I was on the sideline. I'd hosted during the day for the grand final um, for the Sunday and then down on the sideline for the grand final and it was just the most epic contest. I don't mm. care if you're a Cowboys fan or a Broncos fan, you can just appreciate it for the, the rugby league that it was. And the game plan was, so I had Gordy on one side, who's Townsville born. Um, so he was, he was never a cowboy, but very much a North Queenslander. So the plan was he, if the Cowboys won, he would go quickly and do all of the winning moments. So, you know, launch Gordy into the, the celebrations. On the other side, I had Darren Lockyer. So if the Broncos win, release the Lockie, you know, mm. get him in there, get Wayne, get everyone, blah, 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 blah. And then because it was such a... Uh, like breathtaking cliffhanger and it all unfolded in slow motion but also so mm. hectically at the same time. So all of a sudden it was chaos, go chaos right? So JT kicks the ball. Gordy has run on to the field with his arms in the air, no microphone, like he's just won the premiership, right? He's And, you know, even though he's a Broncos legend. This, right, yeah. just did, like he'd bolted, like he was... And I saw his arms in the air and I thought he doesn't have a microphone so there's no way he can do an interview. And then Lockie is on his haunches beside me, shattered, in tears. And then we're getting screaming with the sold out home bush, go, go, go. So my job was just supposed to be the crummer to pick up, you know, the bits and bobs and the blokes who struggle a little bit and da, 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 da. You know, so I'm, I'm very happy to be that person. And then it was like, Vonnie, Vonnie, go, go, go. And I was like, and I've just started walking into the middle. I wasn't really sure what we were doing or what I was supposed to be doing. And I grabbed JT and it was like we were just spinning around. It's the worst interview of my life because I'm so overawed by the situation. He has like, his eyes are like dinner plates. He's like, mm. what has just happened? Everyone's like clamoring on. There's, It was just sensational. I think that moment for me, 2014, was pretty special um, just for the South's mm. uh, situation and to, to be able to talk to Sam in that moment uh, as well and to have John Sattler there, um, that's one that will stay with me. Sharks in 2016 yeah. because it was just all those real history mm. sort of drought breaker moments. Um, and, then, and then I'm lucky enough to be able to do those more quiet moments where you get one-on-one -on -one and you get to sit across from someone and learn so much more about them and... Rugby league is um, so in, 
it's not inclusive and it really doesn't matter where you're from or, um, you know, your background, there's a place for you in the game. And when people are able to share a little bit more about their journey, I find that such a privilege to be able to sit with them. Yeah, it is that almost that those big groundbreaking stories that you know, you're part of it. It must be incredibly special to like be on the field and get that, you know, you're not looking at it through the camera. You get that emotion, con emotional connection. But then there's those stories that need to be told. And th th there's sometimes our, our game, there's some negative headlines. And I'm just thinking back to, I, I remember um, the the barbecue gate yeah. with um, the, the, the dragons and Paul Vaughan was on via Zoom because it was COVID and whatnot. And you had to navigate that interview. How, how difficult is that when you've got this negative story a lo lot of press you get the exclusive so you've got to steer that conversation and obviously it was an emotional time what what what's it like being that that person to share that story that you know um there's so many eyeballs going to be on it and there's also ramifications you know yeah. when a player's messed up they're probably this will be it for them at some point in some capacity, whether it's it for them at that club or that team or, you know, whether it, it – and, yeah, the, the barbecue gate one was – because Paul was so shattered by that stage and I think what sh what they thought was going to be not a big deal turned out to be the biggest of deals. Mm. And it, it sort of the, – the story wasn't just that Vaughan had everyone over for a beer and – a snag. It was more about the culture of what was d going on at the Dragons at that point and why some people went, why some people didn't, you know, where's the team at, who was there, who ran off, who did what. Um, so it was it was a multifaceted thing and just we all laser focused on the barbecue. And so Paul then, he jumped on 360 and, and he, he was shattered mm. um, and I think he was just disappointed and... <clears throat> you know, inevitably he ended up leaving the club. But your responsibility at that stage is to say, I really appreciate you joining us. You obviously feel terrible about everything that's happened. You know, why? Why did you invite everyone over? What's happening? What, what do you know about what's the club said to you? Mm. You know, I think you've got to be mindful of people and, and we're just humans at the end of the day. People mess up. And rugby league, do you know what I love about the game is that, yeah, we, we mess up, we do. But at least we we wear it. We take most of the time we take accountability for it. We don't try and sweep it under the carpet. We don't try and pretend that we're something that we're not. We don't try and pretend that we're perfect. Um, the papers will splash with it. Fox will go with it. They they air the dirty laundry because that keeps us accountable to the standards that we want to hold true in the game. And there was a few years ago. It was it was a really difficult time to to be in rugby league, um, we had some really serious crimes being committed mostly against women and I think it was a line, it was a cultural reckoning at that point and we really had to get serious about who we were as a game and who we were as a community and what standards we wanted to drive in in terms of what was going on in our homes and what was going on in our communities, what was going on in our clubs. And it sort of felt like we'd, we'd tried to address it leading up to it and then we just had that flashpoint. I can't remember what year it was, 2014, 2015. No, it must have been later than that. It was that, oh gosh, 18, 19, something like that. And I think it was very tough to talk to players and people impacted and, and, and clubs impacted and, and what we, who we thought we were, we were actually a long way from that and we needed to change and to have those sort of conversations again is really difficult um, but I think we're in a far better place for it. So, yeah, when you have to do those negative stories, it's tough but I think they're also essential and I yeah. think it's also that openness is a strength of ours. Yeah, it, I mean, we're, we're, and this isn't, um, you know, this isn't um, putting it, making it okay for those negative stories. But if you've got a group of men and women now that the job description is to run in to one another, um, you know, you can't just expect them to do that. There's some cer certain personality types. And I actually think our great game of rugby league makes society better that these people 
have a, a, an avenue and, and, and goals and an anchor and a, and a reason not to be steered off the wrong track. But some of those people, by very, if the nature of their job is to run into people, they, they're going to make some uh, m- mistakes, let's just say, off the field. So Yeah, you're completely right. And you've, you've done a lot of research into this and <clears throat> the personality type, and it's quite similar for a lot of rugby league players, male and female now. I think you guys are risk takers mm. and you're you're not afraid of physical pain. So there's a very – and it also makes you susceptible to depression and suicide because and you're thrill, not afraid. Thrill-seeking thrill behaviours as well, which don't often – well, sometimes don't align with the laws of the land. That's right. And so we can't then sit back and celebrate these superhuman heroic feats that take a little bit of extra whatever it is that – these athletes have and then expect them to not take the same risks off the field and not think about the no consequences off the field as well. Um, But I think we're getting better at understanding that and putting more parameters and support around, hopefully. That's it. It's about about putting the support around it because, you know, people in all walks of life get into positions sometimes where they just go, they can't see the wood for the trees and they can't realise that they don't realise the impact of their decisions or their behaviour, or they end up, and rugby league can be all-consuming, and sometimes you can, and sport can be, and life can be, and you just go, fuck it. Mm. I don't care. I, I, you know what? I'm going to self-sabotage here. Yeah. yeah. I, I, whatever happens, happens, and then sometimes that behaviour will be in the public spotlight and you got to sort of fit not only that individual but their club and the game has to sort of face the music as well. But It's also really hard. We're watching these young athletes grow up too. Yes. You know, like we see these uh, often they're, you know, in their early 20s, even younger in their late teens and they're going through life's learning curves in front of everyone. And so, you know, for Joe Public out there who's saying, well, why would he do that? That's so stupid. I mean... We've we've all gone and made some really stupid decisions in our youth. And we're not trying to just we're not trying to justify, no, 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 to justify no, no. these. And I'm one of those people that think or... you are a role model, whether you want to or not. Like I know people say, "Oh, I'm a rugby league player. I didn't sign up for this." I think it's now an inherited thing that you are seen, and so people want to be you. They want to be like you, and so whether you wanted it or not, it's just happening. The kids do. They want to be like their heroes. And but that but that said, Vonnie, I think what rugby league in terms of role models, you know, it, the, the role model is nobody out there is perfect. You will make mistakes. Some have more, more um, consequences than others. But if you're willing to work hard, you'll be able to mm. get build yourself back up. And we've seen many of examples of that. And I, I don't like the idea that role models should be super clean cut because I, I think that then that puts a lot of pressure on youngsters to think well i've got i've got this uh, this ideal yeah, of don't perfection. fail don't yeah, fail don't never, mess it up yeah don't me- yeah. don't mess up never make a mistake yeah ne- never make a wrong decision because it's that's the overwhelming majority 99.9 percent of people will be in that position so the role model is okay you make a mistake you fucked up what are you going to do about it now mm. How do you recover? How do you? Uh, yeah. How, how do, do you, you earn manage? back the trust? That's right. How do you earn back that that sentiment or whatever it may be? Because that's life. Mm. That's absolutely life. And whether we want to accept it or not, that's just what is going on in in everyone's you know family and yeah. friendship groups and clubs and communities and you know it's it's that's life and life is a game in many ways and we're very lucky that our game is a, probably a pretty true reflection of if you work hard enough, often you will be rewarded. If you make the right choices, then you'll you'll be acknowledged for that. But if you're not perfect, that's okay. Mm. No. We'll, yeah, and you can be perfect and then you can mess it up. <laughs> and as long as that mess up isn't too far past the line, yeah. Yeah. we'll bring you back in if you make the right decisions. And We're pretty tolerant, don't you think? For, yeah, for the most part, yeah, we don't yeah. We, we we do give people opportunities to better themselves and prove that this maybe was a mistake or a, a decision from a previous life and reform characters and all that. I think we're we are a, a really good game at doing that. Obviously, there's 
some lines that just can't be crossed that you go well and <clears throat> i think we'd all all agree with, if those lines gets crossed then you, you don't come back in but but for most things we we're pretty accommodating to to bring people back it's it is funny because i think watching the game and and like i'll just use you as an example you know james graham most ferocious competitive you know flashpoint anger guy that we have and you're such a big teddy bear you come in you like your cups of tea <laughs> you know you might have a bicky you've got wonderful things Might. To say. might you can destroy might. This, you delete yeah. all of the arnott's family disorders but it's such a wonderful family man like you know it's funny we get these big reputations of these guys like michael ennis i know he's a mm. great friend of yours we thought he was the greatest pest and such a good guy mm. like one of the most diligent that we have yes. at Fox. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's funny, you just, you think about these reputations of these giant rugby league players and, and like Mal, you know, oh, big and mortal and, you know, change the game and, you know, kangaroos, maroons, everything. And then, you know, you, you go, oh, Mal, would you like a, would you like a can of, oh, yes, funny, I'll, I'll, I'll get up and make a cup of tea. Like just like nice, well, great people. Do, do you know what I don't, like, um, probably multiple personality disorder, but I was almost playing a character when I was playing well, yeah. like on, in the 80 minutes. Yeah. Almost, not entirely. That probably was a true reflection of me. But then I'd meet people <laughs> and they'd be like, well, you're a lot different than what I imagined. Yeah. And I was like, well, what were you thinking? You like, don't go oh, home you see, and you're like murder very animated. You're like, in your yeah, you're like, oh, you're very, you're very, you're very animated on yeah. the field. And, you, and I'm like, what did you expect me to? Just be like, hey, mate, how are you? Yeah. yeah, you know, like, <laughs> I what? Think they do. Where, well, they do. I they, think they, they expect <laughs> you to be like you are on the field. Like, try, like I'm like, no, thankfully, I'm very different. Um, <laughs> just, just on that, Bonnie, you, you, you spoke a, a, a few about a few of the the, the former players that become. Uh, pundits for you as the host what makes a good pundit um, sideline yeah yeah, yeah. co-commentator co whatever it may you, be. would you agree with me it's not as easy as it looks yeah it it it, it look i guess when i was younger and watching it it looks easy i think a lot of players go yeah. i'll just do media when i'm done yeah. i'll just do media <laughs> it's, it's yeah. actually it takes yeah. a lot more i mean you've made an incredible transition and there's only really a few that have made such a good, and I think back in the early days, like Sterlo was really one of the first to become that um, you really articulate uh, ex-champion that had all the runs on the board as a player, but also could push the game and explain the game in a way that fans had never really heard before. Gus, obviously, because he's a genius. Um, but what makes I think you guys now you're so you understand the contemporary game, you understand the players that are still playing, you understand the the cut and thrust of what it is in the modern competition and you're able to explain it in a way that is so entertaining but also I learn something. So every time you speak, every time I listen to a podcast, every time you do something pre-game, post-game, whatever, I learn something. I learn something about the game. I think that's what makes a good um, ex-footy slash current expert. Um, you know, it's like working with Joey at nine, he was – you. He chimes in when he wants to. Joe's got his own timing on everything. He sees everything differently, he always has, did as a player and, and will forever as a human. But when he would lean, you'd have to read his body language. So he'd sit back, don't come to me, not partaking. But then a couple of hours later he'll lean forward and then he'll just say something that stops you in your tracks and you go, oh, my God, <laughs> that, that is phenomenal. Or he'll say, watch this. They're going to go left here. And then he'll, it's like he's this rugby league Nostradamus and he'll see through time and he would have seen something unfold and you go, oh, that's bloody good. Yeah. <laughs> that's the eighth immortal in full flight right there. And I think things like that make me rock back in my chair as a fan. I go, wowee, wow. Like they just, you guys are able to see things that we can't and, and we're very grateful as fans that you're able to open our eyes to what it is we're watching unfold in real time. And I think that's the immediacy, immediacy as well. Um, but, yeah, what makes a good expert? Um, yeah, just something that you're able to communicate and, and tell fans who are sitting at home and enjoying their game because really at the end of the day they want to be able to go to their family or to the pub or to their mates the next day and go, I oh, just see that. You know, I just see when they 
on the fifth set and they did this and that was their option. And then it makes them look like a genius as well. So yeah. it's, it's, it's one of those things you just want to be able to enjoy. It's got to be entertaining at the end of the day. We're going to take a quick break from this podcast to talk to you about AG1. Now, this is a foundational nutritional supplement that I take every single day. There's a lot of stress, a lot of noise around there. Nobody knows what exact supplements to take. The whole cocktail sometimes, that's what it feels like you need to. But AG1, Charlie, take care of it all. That's the thing that I love the most. I've cleared out my cupboard. I've now just got AG1 packets on the shelves, and I love it. I have it every day, nice glass of cold water, and it's really helped me with my gut health. You know, that's something that I've sort of struggled with over the years, and so it's really improved me. That side of things, I feel like I've got a lot more energy. And I know it's been really beneficial for you as well, Jimmy. Any athlete knows the benefit of micro habits. And this is one of those. You just get a small glass of nice cold water, one scoop of AG1. It seems like nothing. But over time, the effects build up and you will feel the benefit just like I did. My gut health was all over the place. And this is the best way to start. I started taking AG1. It's got all the key ingredients that you need, the vitamin C, the probiotics, the prebiotics, the zinc, everything that you think you need. The team at AG1 have formulated this supplement to take the stress out of it. All you need to do, the micro habit every single day, and you will get the results later down the track. And as well, the best thing about it is, Charlie, tastes great too. You're exactly right, Jimmy. Tastes delicious. And AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. And since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. AG1 is a supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs on a daily basis. And that's why they've been a partner for so long. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. We've got an exclusive offer for buy round listeners. So if you want to try AG1, you'll get a free one year supply of vitamin D3, K2, and five free AG1 travel packs, which really, really do come in handy. You get those with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com forward slash buy round. That's drinkag1.com forward slash buy buy around check it out you will not be disappointed i trust ag1 this is a product that i use each and every single day for around the last 18 months you spoke a, a little bit up a, a little bit about home life there uh you're married to chris o'keefe yes a political uh, journalist is that would that be his correct um, yeah, he's on He's on radio. He, he was a political journalist for Channel 9 for many years and now he's on radio doing um, Drive Shift on 2GB. Um, we met 10 years ago. He was the young – I'd just started in the newsroom at Brisbane uh, for Channel 9 and my sports department at that stage was Wally Lewis, Ian Healy and Andrew Slack like and, and me. So I was like a kid in a candy store. I was like, there is no way I deserve to even have a desk at this <laughs> department. <laughs> this is ridiculous. So um, I had just started there maybe a couple of months at the start of 2013 and um, and Chris ended up, he was a, he was doing crime round at that stage and um, we went out one night probably, I don't know, a few months after he started and we ended up, we just haven't stopped since. Like we ended up seeing each other and um, we tried to keep it low key because, you know, office romance and we don't want people talking about it and, you know, it's all a bit awkward. And then I moved to Sydney. He was there a couple of weeks afterwards and, um, yeah, so that was 10 years ago. And um, he's a big Dragons fan as well, he's isn't massive, he? He's a No, I he's a red he, and white nut job. It's, uh, it goes beyond being a Dragons I can, fan. I can remember when he put a tweet out and you, I think we were behind this and you were like, oh, God, oh what's, God. He, what's he said this for? <laughs> no. So he really weighs into a lot of rugby league, which is wild because I would never do anything political. Yeah, right? like, but you know what? You know, I reckon that would be great if you're, like, if you're going to comment yeah i want i want to just just tee off on elbow on something yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's i mean he's he yeah he he still talks about like 2010 like it's the greatest and probably is the greatest day of his life despite <laughs> getting married and having a baby um i think for him again like rugby league was all about him growing up and um he worked at the leagues club and you know he's so yeah there's a lot of footy chat in the house do you ever go, um, do you ever go home and just be like oh I've heard this 
wild rumor the dragons are about to sign no he says that to me so he goes you you know what you should just make something up no i might actually i might just that's the way to do it deluxe he'll be on the phone to flano no he um (laughs) would he phone flano he is a serial pest to flano i have to seriously when i see flano when at work i'm like i'm so sorry about my husband just block him please do you don't have to answer what does he call him what does he say just nonsense things like oh you should hear the big the big offer that they're going to take and he'll like insert a new player every single week oh we've got millions to offer this but i'm like that player is never going to the dragons you are deluded so he's so he, he's properly in the know he, trying to hustle information just like he cannot big help super himself fan. yeah he is a mega fan yeah it's and i actually sometimes forget so say the dragons are playing on a sunday sunday is our family day i don't work at fox and so i'll forget that the dragons are playing and then i'll just hear like this He'll disappear and then I'll hear this swooshing down the hallway and he would have gone and got his little dragon spray jacket on and he, he puts his little red and white kit and swoosh, swoosh, swoosh down he comes the hallway and I'm like, what do you want? Oh, they're about to kick off, aren't they? And he sits there in his kit. It's, um, I mean, he, he bought the baby all this like little onesies and he was stuffing the poor baby in like a sausage into a casing into the onesies. Oh. It was, yeah, it was, it's a lot. He um, he actually snuck a little um, dragon's onesie into the maternity ward when we had our baby. That's how hardcore this man is about footy. And it is fun, but then I realised very early on in the relationship we actually couldn't watch Origin together because he's obviously very much a New South Welshman, I'm a Queenslander, and it was like wild to see some of the decisions he – and we'd end up having a Barney and I'm like, man, we can't watch footy together. This is – you're not right in the head. So um, we, we do talk a lot about footy. Um, do you ever just think, though, like because it is a bit your job, like you just think, mate, just – can we talk about something else? I don't mind. I could talk oh, footy you, all the time. Yeah, yeah, I love it. You love it. <laughs> um, we also, and we love horse racing too, so we can talk about that. But, um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of footy chat. And it is funny to hear how excited he gets about the dragons. <laughs> <laughs> God love him. Oh, that's good. Hey, you, you spoke there about um, starting a, uh, a young family. Was it a difficult decision? You were a host of NRL 360 at the time. Um a very um, real dilemma for a lot of females in the workforce about whether or not to start a, a family and the impact that that would have on their on their job. You're in this, you know, one of the most sought after positions. Yeah, I think when I first started in the industry, having a child was definitely seen as a negative, you know, because you weren't available 24-7 they you know like they go oh, but she's a mum like it's a bad thing right oh she can't come here she can't go there no 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 but I think I've been in the industry long enough now that again there's been a shift and there have been women so Lara Pitt's a great example she's got three kids uh Jess Yates got two kids Hannah Hollis had a baby so I think at Fox we've been able to um really shift the culture on that and it's more celebrated um, which has been really nice. So, yeah, we, we waited. A, we, we were trying to have a baby for a little while, so it took us a little while. So by the time it actually happened and it all sort of within one week I found out and then Ben Iken had left 360. So I jumped in the 360 chair almost knowing that I was on very limited capacity. <laughs> and I oh. thought, oh, gosh. But it was too early to say anything and I thought, look, we'll just get to the end of the season and we'll deal with that later. Um and, and, yeah, I, by the time we got after, I think it was about November, by the time I told our boss and just said, hey, look, I don't know what next year is. I don't know what your plans Because I never thought I was the permanent replacement for Ben Ike and I always thought I was just the caretaker, you know, because it all happened really quickly when Ben left to go to the Broncos and um, and I thought, look, I'm, I'm just sort of the person that jumps in and, yeah, just get us to the end. <laughs> I, I never really thought it was my job permanently. So for me it was it was okay. But, yeah, I think the decision to have a baby and you've got to be okay with stepping away and you've got to be okay with missing out on a few opportunities. Um, but I was so professional – I am so professionally fulfilled and there's really nothing that I sit at home thinking, oh, gosh, I wish I could go do that um, because I've just been in the industry for so long. I think I've, I've done everything – above and beyond my wildest dreams. Um, so I'm really happy now to to have those quiet days at home <laughs> with the family. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Provide it's, some balance. Yeah, it's, it's been fantastic. It is an in, because it, it, it is an intense job. Like I speak about the, 
the amount of preparation that goes into it, but then you just have the, those quiet times as well. Yeah, it is nice. So we, by the time we were um, pregnant, we were thrilled. Um, and look, we'd still love to add to our family. So, you know, hopefully we're not quite done, but who knows? But um, yeah, I mean, and I, I wasn't very, like I never thought I'd be a good mum, even though I realised that I've probably mothered all the guys I've worked with for 20 years. <laughs> and I think growing up, I was always the kid that they'd sit beside the naughty boy to make sure that he would pay attention. And which bizarrely, like through my primary school, I was like, why do I always have to sit next to the boys that are so naughty and they can't read or write and I'd have to help them. And, and, and then I, I now understand that was setting me up perfectly for what I do yeah. now. I'm sitting beside all the naughty boys that make the fart jokes and, <laughs> and are quite funny. So really I've, I've been perfectly groomed for this position for a long, long time. Um, but, yeah, and I think the other thing that really is sort of for motherhood for me, and I left it probably a bit late, like I'm in my early 40s, but um, I I think my adoption sort of played into that a little bit. So I think even though my mum and dad were beautiful and they always told me that I was adopted and I, I think you just kind of hang on to that weird dynamic a little bit and meeting my birth mum was great. I, I got a letter in the mail um, probably when I was about 19 just saying, you know, are you a Von Sampson born on this date in Townsville? If so, call this number. And I thought, oh, here we go, someone needs a kidney or some bone marrow or <laughs> something like that. And I called and she was from an adoption agency and she said, oh, we, we've got First of all, do you know you're adopted? I said, yeah, yeah. She goes, oh, gosh, that's a relief. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. No, she said you wouldn't believe how many people don't know. No, and but you can't ask. No, I know. Can you imagine? Matter of fact. And pe people do find out like that. Like it's Do they? Yeah. Or on it's like some deeply held family secret. and Yeah. So anyway, God bless Bob and Janice Sampson. They told me right from the get-go. Um, yeah, I mean, that phone call. Yeah, I know. You, um, you'd think they'd have a different protocol. <laughs> yeah. The, like maybe let's this call a while ago. the – like yeah. you, you're – your mum and dad, your, uh, you know, yep. the people that brought you up and let's say. Does, just checking. Just check. Does, <laughs> does she know? Yeah. Where are like we at not, with the information? <laughs> hey, how you going? You're right. Do you know you're adopted? Yes. Yeah, so got any questions? <laughs> anyway, there was, it was, um, she said, we've got this woman, her name, you know, is this, and she'd like to send you a letter and she's your birth mum. And I said, yeah, fine. So we wrote letters for a little bit and then we ended up meeting and I made this, she said, oh, do you want to catch up for dinner on this date? And I said, yeah, sure. Not realising it was a Wednesday and it was state of origin. So I was a little on edge and I know how bad that is, right? So I was like, ooh, I have to go. <laughs> we've just kicked off. <laughs> so then after the dinner, like it's big, like life-changing dinner and I'm like yeah. racing home trying to find out what the score is. Um, and then my birth dad, I was working, I was probably 26 or something. And I, <clears throat> I was the nearest, I had a, I was out, um, with a cameraman doing a different job and we were the nearest crew to a, a fatal on the Bruce highway. So we went there and usually when you rock up to a fatal, you've got, you just wait for the, the, you know, the supervisor or the acting whatever to come over and just give you an update, you know, it's, this is who's deceased and da, 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 this is what happened. And as this man walked towards me, I thought, oh, gosh, he looks familiar. I don't know why I think I know this person. And I looked at his face and it was really similar. I looked at his name tag and went, oh, gosh, that's – I must have run into this person. Anyway, so we did the interview. He walked away and then it occurred to me that was my birth father. And so I thought, oh, gosh. What? Because you get given – when you're adopted, you get given a little birth certificate. It says null and void, but it's got their names on it and, you know, what they would have called you. So – and I thought, my gosh, I just met him. And it didn't seem fair that I knew who he was and he didn't know who I was. So That's insane. I, I ended up writing a letter a couple of days later and I just dropped it off to the fire station and um, and just said, hey, this is who I am. We met the other day. No expectations because, again, you don't know if they've told their family if they had a baby, you know, 20-odd years ago. You know, you don't know people's set up. Um, so I said, look, no expectation. You never need to get in contact with me. But if you do, here's my number. Lovely to meet you. All the best with everything. And he got straight on the phone. He's like, oh, my God, what a relief. Every time I go out to something or a house fire, and I was like, oh, my gosh, this is how old she would have been at this time. And, you know, where is she? Is she okay? Um, so, yeah, it was nice to just reconnect. And I think it was just a touch base to make sure everyone's okay. <laughs> I'm okay. They're okay. They're mostly normal. <laughs> That is insane. <laughs> yeah. So I think all that sort of fed into me not thinking I'd 
be a good mother. I don't know. It all sort of, I, I think I probably carried it for a bit, but now I am a mother and I, I love it. It's the best thing ever. I wish I had 10 of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm one of seven. Yes. And see? you don't want <laughs> that. There's a, no. See, in real life, my name is Yvonne O'Keefe and that makes me sound so Irish. And that what do you I mean sh- in real life? In real life, well, because um, Fox wouldn't be bothered changing it on air. <laughs> so they said, well, keep you Samson because it's just easier because I was, you know, it was so entrenched by well, that. You, is that your career name? Well, I think people call it a show name. It's not really a show name. I just, I think it was easier not to just change the marketing. Like, let's just keep it Samson for work and and for my real life, yeah, Yvonne O'Keefe. But as you would understand, it makes me life. feel very Irish. <laughs> like I should have 10 kids and that like potatoes no. boiling away on the no, stove. <laughs> no, you um, – no, look, I, I, I loved the chaos of growing up in the big house. Yeah. But – No, see, as an only child, it's like this like amazing mm. pipe dream. I'm like, my God, yeah. there must be so many people in the house. Always, someone to, always someone to fight with. Yeah. <laughs> You think the politics in your house is bad at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> you just go back like, ah, oh, they're not talking to this thing. It's like, oh. There's a reason. At I home with Australia. the Grahams, I there's love a, it. There's a reason I live in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Mum and dad are out at the moment as well. <laughs> Staying for eight weeks in Graham. my house. I love it. Uh, that's great. Four <laughs> weeks down, not counting. So, yeah. Can't um. get a hint. <laughs> Some great places to check out in Australia, Mum and Dad. They involve. Uh, I'll, I'll even lend you my car and pay for the petrol. You should go see them. Yeah, you should. Drive. The big pineapple's beautiful this time of they year. Drive up to the Northern Territory or all the way to South Australia, or even just drive to Perth. For the next trip. four weeks, it'd be great. <laughs> uh, anyway, to sort of, sort of turn back to um, to football, but that, that I was not expecting to hear that. But that is. Yeah, fascinating. The the randomness um intrigues me. Like yeah. how random events can can shape or change us. And that is that's one of the, the most random events <laughs> I've ever heard oh, about. Really? Like that's it's crazy. The best thing about the birth family is they don't like my, my immediate birth parents don't know anything about rugby league or sport. I couldn't care less. But then like the extended family up around towns, well, they're like obviously like hardcore cowboys. Like it's so every wedding and christening, it's all governed around when the cowboys kick off. Mm. So we get that out of the way and then the TV's wheeled out into the backyard and everyone sits around with a uh, a nice cold stubby and, yeah, watches the footy. So, yeah, it is it is nice. Well, on to the football. Being gay – oh, sorry, back to the football rather. Being involved in – the media what can what what do you think the game should do to help help it grow or help it continue to grow what sort of viewer experience can or should the game provide so we were on a um uh on a show this year and Abby Collister was mic'd up in the warm now I think back to my attitude as a player I would have hated that we wouldn't have even approached you because we know it's a yeah. no from you. I, well, and also <laughs> yes. you definitely, yeah, I, I would have just been, no. There are some players who are more sympathetic to the media yeah. and God love you, Jimmy, but you were not one. No, no. <laughs> well, I, and, you know, it was probably a reflection of some of the coaches I had. Correct. Which, there you know, are. Like it was yes. us against them and yes. you can morph into that sort of personality. Mm-hmm. Um, but it just... Is is the game providing enough access? Is that do all the sports do the media uh, better than what we do? I'm so proud of how we do our coverage first and foremost. I think our coverage is probably world class. Um, when even when you look at American sports, I think we offer a lot for the fan, um, which I'm so proud to just be such a small part of that. I think the in interest and intense appetite for footy especially this year has been off the scale like the the viewerships the clicks the game attendances um I think everyone was just really into rugby league this year so I, I'm I don't I think we need to keep building on that um avenues like your podcast different podcasts they're like 
there are so many options But now. what about that game day experience? Oh, though? game day experience? So get, get, like I'm thinking, like I was fascinated by Coruscant yeah. in the warm-up. Yeah. And even though like I know he's not going to give too much away and I had so much feedback from people, oh, that's great. Like yeah. you're getting questions while they're warming up. Like yeah. that's, that's something that can elevate the game, get people interested, you know, in the... You know, with the, the sporting stage, the competition has never been greater. And if we can provide that yep. little bit of extra cream on the top. So stuff like that's pretty extraordinary. Yeah. And then to have you or the experts then ask the right questions in the right moment so that we get a response. So then all of a sudden as a fan, I am now feel like I'm sitting right like shotgun beside Appy as he's going through things. So the next evolution of that would be a game experience mic up so game like in real time if we can hear not just happy but any sort of player in the middle of a game if we now go okay commentators hold let's go right into the middle of this and we hear what it is as a player experiencing going through the sets or coming up with the fifth tackle option or whatever it is i think dipping in and out in that regard for a live rather than just warm up that that would be that would be amazing um, because that's all fans want. Oh, that's all I want. Mm. I can't play the game like that. Please help me. You tell me what it's like to experience. What are they going through? And so when, as a fan, you're like, what is he doing? Why mm. would you do that? And imagine being able to hear their thought pattern or the communication. And we have some really brilliant communicators in footy and especially out on the field. And some are really comfortable. And I think we're getting into that generation now. They're so comfortable in front of a camera. A lot of their lives are on the phone. They're on social media. They document everything they do from the moment they wake up to the moment they go to sleep. They're very comfortable sharing. They're very good at communicating. They're used to being having an audience yeah. dipping in and out of their lives. I think as long as nobody was critical of yeah. words used or, or expressions used, then we've got to acknowledge the fact that in the heat of battle some yep. words might get said that aren't for little ears yes um, it would have to come with a warning yes <laughs> um but you, you know what? i'm even just thinking back to um some of my times with you and you know we're supposed to have player x on before the <laughs> game and then the text comes through half an hour before oh they've said no nah. no nah. like, <laughs> that's pretty normal that is normal yeah but should and again, I've worn the player's hat. I've, I've worn that hat of like, God, I just want to get to the game. I, do the current crop of, crop of players need to sort of embrace that a, a little bit more to help promote it? I think in NBA, um, the TV networks have access, cha in changing room access up to 15 minutes before. Yep. And it's just part of the culture where the, yeah, they're not playing a collision sport, so it is slightly different, but the players embrace it yep. and they understand the role that the media, uh, but well, basically the media fund their pay pack, the, the pay packets. And again, I've, my opinion. Which if, as you know, as a player, you didn't care about so much. Like if, if, yeah. if Fox went to you and went, James, you've got to do a pre-match interview. We're paying your salary. Yeah, You'd be yeah, like, I, I like, could not care less. Yeah, yeah, Get well, out of my face. I, I'm, I'm getting on with it. Yeah. I'm working here. Yeah, that's right. I'm, I'm in the I've zone. got a job. Please get out of my mm. face. And I totally respect that. But I think also we're probably, yeah, we. I think the players now understand that there is um, a, a greater demand on their time and on their thoughts and, and hearing from them. So if we could, prior to kickoff, get into a dressing room and hear those really – that really protected space of a coach yeah. when he's giving that final delivery. I mean, that would be phenomenal. But also we, you try not to be intrusive. And I think we tried to do something similar with um, the documentary with Tiger Town and, and you know, mic'd up um, Madge Maguire and to sort of get into what is it that they're going through, what is it that the West Tigers are experiencing. And, um, and there were lots of things that we didn't show um, through the request of Madge and of the club. Um, but just to understand a little bit more about what it is to be on game day and what it is to experience it. But that wasn't live, so those episodes were turned around. Well, well, it's a way to get our game to a, to a new audience. Mm. If you look at um, some of the sporting documentaries that Brilliant. the streaming, streaming services provide, so uh, the F1, yep. like that, the popularity of Formula One in the United States has never been as big and it's not down to 
the drivers, the cars. It's about this human interest story yeah. that Netflix put out there that people all of a sudden become interested in. Like I've I've not watched that se- series, but I've listened to some um, podcasts about um, sport and exposure that um, and and how we how we can do it. And it's often through those human interest stories. Sunderland till I die. Yeah. I didn't give a rat about Sunderland. Perfect. But then example. all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, I wonder if they'll. What's happened with Jack Rodwell? Yeah. Will he? Yeah, oh. we are Wrexham. Like all of yeah. it, you've got to yeah. just sell the stories. You've got to learn the characters. And so can, can, should, do you think League should be pushing yeah. for for more of that? We had Tiger Town, which probably didn't give us that no. same level as interest as what you know the other show, like the quarterback. Or, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know the the Manchester. There was a Manchester City one where they went behind the scenes. That, that that's Pep Guardiola. If he's willing yeah. to access all areas so there needs to be a little bit of a shift in the old mentality yeah. so you know the some of the old coaches i don't need to name them yeah. but we all know who they are um and some of the old administrators and we all know who they are but if they could trust and if they could have uh a buy-in to to say listen this is what we want to do we want to bring the game in a different perspective into new eyeballs and you don't have to be a rugby league fan to enjoy mm. this because you're going to fall in love with the characters yeah it's it's, it's not yeah. the game or the sport it's human it's yeah. the human interest where you're like oh that person intrigues me yeah i want i want, I want follow up because I think rugby league has the best characters. It does but we don't <laughs> yeah. and they get and I know that they've been burnt by the media i understand that um but there is a way to do it Mm. where everyone's satisfied yeah i think you know what my opinion is i think most coaches and most administrators are very secretive they they think that they've got this like they're paranoid James. well they're paranoid <laughs> that they're going to say it. they're paranoid that what they're going to say is going to be used against them as motivation to another place and now that does happen where but it's usually like Look at what this player did on the field to us mm. last time we played. Mm. Let's get after them. Yeah, okay. But it's often the team that win that talk about that experience. And the team that loses, they probably had the same thing about oh, look what they said about us. And yeah. to be honest. Isn't that with, what builds rivalries? And with the with the coaches, <laughs> it's all relatively similar. Yeah. And you know, they <laughs> like to th- they <laughs> like to think that they've reinvented the wheel. But most of them are pretty close and most team environments are yeah pretty similar i i think the the opportunity for for our game to to get a jump it is through those access all areas it's something that the american sports have embraced and american sports are now pushing here into australia where you know you the nfl on a monday morning mm. that's got plenty of eyeballs on yeah. it because of, and and some of that is due to you know the popularity of that that sport in general, but a lot of it is now with that those docu- the quarterback documentaries yeah. that, that that's I'm, I'm, I'm and Taylor into, I want, Swift we haven't yeah. even touched on that I, I, I want <laughs> I want I want to go I want I want to go see what this yeah. this person's now up to. So, in speaking of America, you can, you're going to Vegas, aren't you? Don't know yet. Still, oh, okay. uh, st- still waiting. That is one of the questions, actually. How much is it? Our game forward- plan for Vegas. <laughs> How much are you looking forward to to Las Vegas? <laughs> but I think that is that. I, I think to to capitalise on that, yeah. especially in year two, we should do an access all areas. Um, NRL goes to Vegas, and then put that to a streaming service sort of around the November, December of 2024. So in 2025, this American audience can be like, or in the build up to maybe January Who of 2025. Oh, look. Oh, yeah. I've watched this documentary. Yeah. Are they going to Vegas? You know what? I want to see. Let's what, go. Let, let, let's let's go yeah. and see the, the follow up. You've seen the experience of 2024. It's really interesting. This game, these human, in, you know, and obviously yeah. the teams may change, but. I think it's something we've we've got to capitalize on. It'd be a shame not to because it's the way sports going. No, and and a great example of what you're saying is that now Wrexham has become like a tourist hotspot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. even the little local pub, they're like, wow, we're run off our feet because people just want to come and see where they filmed it and what's yeah. happening and these are the players and this is the pub they all the fans show up to and mm-hmm. their merch is flying off the shelves. Well, the, the NRL, they 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 
whether it's an NRL issue or a club land issue, they need to do, do it. I don't think it's an NRL issue. I've I've had conversations exactly like this with, with people in the NRL um, and they're wholeheartedly supportive of it. It's about establishing those parameters of trust that one club, and it'd have to be a big one, yeah. would throw open the doors for an entire season and let us get in there and get into the minutiae of it. It'd be interesting to to go to the States and ask those TV bosses, streaming bosses, how they to did say, it. how did you get in? Yeah. Like, what was the... How did you convince a, Patrick Mahomes to yeah, say yes? Was it just a purely yeah. financial incentive or was it, you know, whatever it may be? Yeah. But I think we we are, in terms of, you know, we we speak about how far we've come in a multitude of areas, one of those being the media, I think we've just scratched the surface. Yeah. That we've still got so much more ground to cover. And as we are um, a little bit of a minority sport, let's not forget that we're not a global sport. Um, the battlegrounds between ourselves, rugby union, um, AFL, like what are we going to do that's going to set ourselves apart? And maybe that's part of the conversation mm. guys, like, we need to do this. Yep. We need to set ourselves apart from from these other sports if we want to continue to grow. This is where we've. This is our um, our action plan, our strategic plan. Let's do it. And it's such a strength if you're able to put yourselves up in the spotlight like that in mm. that capacity, and to have people streaming all over the world. I mean, we grabbed a little bit of international notoriety when we got back in playing. We were the first professional sport yes. in the world through COVID. And I think some of that forward thinking is still required if we want to keep pushing some of those parameters. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, we're not too far away from wrapping it up, um, Yvonne. What's the future holding for you? Um, like what, what do you, what do you, where do you see yourself going? What are you? What I've are you never been at trying to achieve. I've, I've never had a plan, which I think has probably worked against me <laughs> at some point. I've never been one to say I really want to do this or really want to do that. I've been so grateful along the way when we do get um, opportunities what does the future hold I'm so happy doing what I'm doing I don't know I've got no no big aspirations I'm yeah I, I think I'm just very content but that I always want to get better there's not one single broadcast that I drive home from and I go oh nailed it mm. <laughs> I got some really good advice I was working on the cricket for Wild World of Sports and um you know Mark Nicholas you, you, do you remember uh the cricket commentator we call him smashing baby because he's got that real suave debonair I think thing. I know yeah. you're talking about. Yeah, anyway yeah. I, I messed something up in the cricket and um and I was really down on myself and he said oh he goes, let me give you a piece of advice. It was never as good as it felt and it was never as bad as it felt. And that actually is pretty good. That's held me in pretty good stead because we make mistakes all the time on air and um, you think they feel massive to you, but really in the grand scheme of things, they're not so bad. So what's the future hold? I don't know. Why don't you and Chris do like an at-home like politics and NRL I don't know if we're interesting Podcast. enough. No, I reckon. No. I reckon there's your gold mine. <laughs> Set up an in-home in-home studio. Be like the dra Forget the dragons. Yeah. What about this policy? Like <laughs> Keeping up with the O'Keefe's. Yeah. I reckon. That, I reckon that's the way to go. Um, next question. We do this uh, each and every week for yes. every guest. Uh, the dream spine. All thanks to Tui's. Tui's are all about teamwork, and each team needs a dream spine wow. or a great spine. Uh, just from your observation, experience. Yeah, this is going to be Queensland heavy, so please well, forgive that's me. Well, that's okay. So you won six, seven, So number and nine, one, please. Billy Slater. That's, he's a very common. Um, Do you think he changed the way the fullbacks played? It was absolutely insane. Yeah. I think, you know what um, made me think about how prepared he was is when he went to a, the, Jewish, the, the judiciary. Um, and he's talked about how much video he'd watched yep. on the person that I can't remember who was going over in the corner. He's like, oh, look, I knew he was doing this hand, that hand. And you're like, oh, God, yeah, this guy. And he's like that now. Very seriously. As a coach, you mm. should see how much video he does on every single candidate that could potentially wear maroon. He does video and all that eagle cam and hours and hours and hours on each player. So he knows exactly what they're going to do when they're – their effort areas yeah and that's it and and most um i don't like the phrase modern day fallbacks but current fullbacks would certainly look to him to try and emulate him yeah and his actions his movements his level of detail the, the there is no place for 
anybody that that's not like that anymore. Well, you look at the way Reese Walsh came out of this year's Origin series. Mm. He was a completely different player, yeah, he and was. apparently Reese was just a sponge around Billy. And mm. as you would like, wouldn't exposure. Yeah. Okay, so Billy's my number one. Uh, number six, oh, Wally Lewis. It's my five eight. None better. The great man. Yeah. I'm gonna go Joey, the halfback. I know, the eighth. Absolutely love it. And nine would be Cameron Smith. I think we're just longevity, durability. Um, and again, very similar to Billy in the way he changed the way that that role was played mm. and the responsibilities of that role. Yeah. Well, that's... Um, Is that not a bad spine? Not, not a bad dream spine. <laughs> Has anyone um, else picked those? They're probably pretty pretty popular. I don't know if we've had that before, to be honest. Like, yeah, there's... Um, yeah, that's that's pretty hard to beat though. That's pretty good. <laughs> it's pretty good. Thank you. I'm so, happy with that. Yeah. Well, uh, big thanks to Tui's for for partnering us with the, on that on that section of the show. Um, Tui's are all about teamwork, and each team needs a spine. Thank you for that, Vonnie. So Billy Slater, Wally Lewis, Joey Johns, and Cam Smith. That would be a, a tough one to beat. A um, couple of other questions we do for each and every guest. Uh, if football didn't exist, what would you be doing? But I guess that's a difficult one no no not at all um oh okay i would be do you know i um every year i do a floristry course a floristry (laughs) course so i actually (laughs) just future proofing myself (laughs) a floristry course so i do my certificate in floristry and um i do different arrangements and yeah i thought oh well if this all goes tits up one day that i could be a florist if, if ai take over <laughs> yeah, the tv right. or your or you've your, all your voice yeah. pre- you don't realize in your contract that yeah. all your voice is being recorded let cyborg vonnie do it yeah, yeah and just like there's this um hologram <laughs> yeah, of you perfect. just being and you'd know the, all the ai knows all the questions you've Amazing. signed it over you don't get any money Heck you flor- arranging yep i'm arranging flowers or riding horses but again i would have had to marry into royalty to, to make that a reality <laughs> but no a florist that's what I, that's my and each um, and every year you have a top of refresher yeah of, yeah i love it what what pardon the ignorance what uh, like ha, surely it's just okay no, you your, go to the markets you pick your different arrangements there's all different what do you mean styles different re- Different arrangements. There's deconstructed. There's oval. There's bouquets. Oh. There's installations. Yeah, I'm, I'm, as you I'm can a tell. floristry nerd. <laughs> as you can tell, I am. Um, and I probably wouldn't do weddings because they seem a bit chaotic. I think I'd probably just contract to like funerals or something really mm. grim. The uh, to, obviously the devil's in the detail, and for me, it's a bunch of flowers. And it's I know. A, there's a bunch of flowers, and there's a bunch of flowers, I know. and they all look pretty similar. Gosh. Like I do. Oh, the beautiful. Yeah, no. You're either a flower person or you're not. I'm definitely a flower person. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I'd be a florist. Fair enough. Um, I wasn't expecting you to say that. <laughs> um, the most interesting person that you've met along the way? Oh, gosh, what a great question. Um, not necessarily the most famous, just... Um, you're very interesting. You always make me think of things differently. That's always fascinating. Um and then, like incredible men like Daniel Anderson, who mm. completely change your perspective, and they're so generous with their time and their their outlook when they've and they're they're so giving, even though he's lost so much. Um, and I'll put Carl Webb in that conversation yeah. as well. Um, yeah, we've had some very interesting. We have some beautifully interesting people in the game. Um, and then there's the really unusual types, like the the Mister Haslers and. Um, you know, the more mysterious men like Ben uh, Wayne Bennett. Um, yeah, all fascinating, very interesting in different ways. Yeah. Ruby League does um, provide us with some certainly interesting <laughs> characters, doesn't it? Um, final one. Uh, a sliding doors moment that you think about um, if the alternative happened. So for me it might be if I made the decision not to come out here to Australia. I think, oh, what would life have been like in England? Is there, is there a sliding doors moment where you think, oh, what would life have been like if... Yeah, if, I think had I uh, walked away from TV when I was told I wasn't cut out for it, and I think, gosh, I wonder, I probably would have still been at home on the sunny coast, living a great life, but I wouldn't have... I think I would have always would have been disappointed because... In the back of my mind, I would have thought, what if? What if you yeah. just backed yourself a bit and went 
went out to Sydney and and to see what was out there. Um, yeah, sliding doors moment. I'm glad I I'm glad I did it. I was a bit lonely for a while in Sydney. <laughs> it's a tough old town, but um, yeah, I'm so glad that I did. Yeah, nice. All right, well, that just about wraps us up, Bonnie. Thank you for uh, joining us here on the buy round and. Um, sharing some of those uh, very personal stories it, it really uh, there was a fascinating chat and uh, i look forward to seeing you soon at maybe the bellagio or somewhere <laughs> yeah, oh along, my God. The, along those lines um, <laughs> we need to game plan if we're going to go seriously <laughs> oh. <laughs> i get nervous i'm getting a bit sweaty thinking about it <laughs> you, you know the issue is the round zero but coming back no i know then you round one but is <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, uh, yeah, it's 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 a business trip, not a holiday. Well, it's James. a work trip. It's a it's working, not mm. fun times. Yeah, that's why I'm sort of if I am gonna go, I want to go early, go uh, like a week early, get yeah. out your system, and then when everyone else arrives, it's like oh, oh I'm just commentate. I'll just. Talk. If I find you in the fountain at Bellagio <laughs> at some ungodly early hour, you're in trouble. Yeah, well, let's hope that doesn't <laughs> Vegas can sweep you up. Um, <laughs> all right, well, funny, I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure.